as the infrastructure grows, which Tesla's maybe pushing from what we just heard from the announcement from yesterday, yesterday, um, that will change. That's what you're saying. As uh, the infrastructure grows, as the infrastructure the standards will then. Yeah, you know, we'll, we'll settle in on a set of standards right. that is palatable. Is it you all are going to decide what the standard is. I, I, may I, I suggest I, a very loose analogy, being an old guy. <laughs> this thing. Yeah. I was on the first field trial of this stuff in Chicago many years ago. It took up a trunk. Mm -hmm. When we finally introduced it, it took up a shoebox. We had multiple standards. We had short range. Mm -hmm. We had apps. We had high prices. Yes. We had little local right. cells that we could only operate in. Right. You couldn't go outside of that without having to find a payphone. Remember, it charged four dollars a minute. It charged exactly. Mm -hmm. The prices were outrageous. Mm -hmm. And guess what? Solved the standards issue. Solved the shoebox issue. Solved the range issue. Mm -hmm. Solved all of that. And now we have teenagers running around with this all over the place, and we almost throw them away. Yeah, but we're also Suggestion. a slow adopter, too, in the United States. Yeah. I mean, look Not at, necessarily. Look at Not necessarily. Well, so watch, watch, you have a standard deviation, well, according to Jeff. That's, that's you have true, a standard but on the other deviation. hand, on the other hand from a cell phone perspective, I spent a lot of time in, in Asia. And there were more people doing stuff with this stuff in Asia than we were doing yeah, here. Yeah, but that's, that's simple. It's a loose analogy. Yeah, it's, a analogy. analogy. No, it's a great sure. analogy. No, it's a great analogy. And I would sort of say, look, I wouldn't worry about the fact that the U.S. Is, is a little bit behind on this. Look, they had a leapfrog. They didn't have the kind of wired system, so they, they adopted the exactly. wireless system earlier. So, you know, there was a greater need, a quicker adoption. Uh, you know, I, I think it is, though, a great analogy. And the point is, it's, it's in a great analogy because it, it basically speaks to, you know, the technology is going to get better. Early adopters have very, are, are willing to bear a lot of pain um, and a lot of uh, and, uh, high costs. And uh, there's a lot of people standing around saying, I have no need, you know, the, the, yeah, the, exactly. the wired phone <laughs> works just fine for me. I, I, I remember because we, we, we were, we were, yeah, our, yeah. Right. we were kind of an early one because we ended up with a child care problem and with, when neither of us was reachable, we bought whatever it cost for that damn cell phone <laughs> because it was really important mm -hmm. to us. But, and so, you know, in any given new innovation, there will be people for whom it be, it's more compelling than others. And mm -hmm. for people who it's not compelling, they're late adopters. It's okay, you know, you gotta get there by way of an S curve and there's mm -hmm. gonna be kind of a, you know, your three years, three years, three years is very interesting because the problem is how do you actually measure progress against that? Because the first three years, it's gonna look like this. Exactly. Right. And so you and don't measure progress years, based no on progress. revenue. Right. Just yes, saying, on those first three years. Or even and how many people rates, yeah. are in adoption well, rates? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to, to talk yeah. to that. So, if you look back at the plug in, or that the Prius, when the Prius first launched, it was 99, um, and 2000 was really kind of the first year. And if you look at those graphs and how they increased, um, they really didn't start taking off until the second generation Prius came out. Mm -hmm. And then they really it, it started to hockey stick. Well, we're, if you look at the 2010 as the start of the EVs, we're already way outpacing that growth of that first Prius. And we haven't gotten to the second gen car yet. Um, so I think that we're on track for pretty massive growth. Um, and, and I'd like to go back just a little bit to, to what you were saying about what we hire. Yeah. And I think, uh, I would argue that for cars and for a lot of the stuff we have, we mainly hire it to live in the future today. And I think any new car that you buy has been marketed to you as the future today. And the reason that the automakers that, that have legacy cars don't push their EVs is because it really is the future today. And what does that say about their whole other line? <laughs> but Tesla is yeah. in the unique position to offer the future today. And I think the reason they had to build their own infrastructure is because they are, have their cars so far in the future, they needed to have the, the, the future charging infrastructure experience and so they've they've offered that and I think that's what's making them so, so, so successful. Yeah, I'm curious about the thinking around the impact on the grid mm. of all of this. Yeah. And especially outside of sunny environments and then knowing that you're mostly charging at night when the solar isn't going to be working. So 
How do you see that playing into the forecast? Sure, let's suggest directly. Would you, uh, uh, we, we, what's that? Yeah, we, we, we could probably split that up. But we could yeah, yeah, split yeah, up. So first. there's a massive under like under usage of the infrastructure at night. I mean, just massive. You could take everyone's car, you could charge it in the middle of the night. We would still have a dip in the amount of energy we use at night. So certainly nighttime charging right. is big. So a good number there is some of the studies suggest that of the two hundred forty million dollar uh, two hundred forty million gas powered vehicles out there. If we were to miraculously change those to 180 million EVs, now we have we don't even have 180 thousand EVs. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. put it in perspective where we are in the chasm. Okay. So 180 million EVs, and they all charge at night. No infrastructure requirement. No new power generation requirement because the grid is built for peak, and at night we shed load. We actually can't turn off power generation quick enough and we purge electrons into the ground mm -hmm. because it's cheaper. So if wow. you simply okay. charged at yeah. night, wow. you would not only be a, it would not only not task the grid, but it would benefit the grid, okay? Because we wouldn't have to shut off power generation and we would have a more efficient power transmission because there's a whole big inertial forces happen when you shut power off mm -hmm. and then yes. have to and do this one thing in the morning, the turn them back on. Mm -hmm. Huge inefficiencies in that yeah. swing. Mm -hmm. So Schneider Electric, this is, this is what we okay. sort of do for a living. Now, everyone knows not everybody will charge at night. You'll want to charge at 5 p.m. when you come home because you're, you're empty. And if a whole bunch of folks charge at 5 p.m. on a hot day with air conditioning is on, you might see a, a transformer problem with the grid mm -hmm. and, a, and, a, and a, quote, serious problem. But what's interesting, and I, I, I chatted about this, is what's going to change the antiquated grid to move into a new developed grid that's a smart grid. Schneider has those answers, okay? But it's got to have the catalyst. So I, what's interesting is EVs are a killer app for the smart grid. Yeah. And then think about this. Mm -hmm. When we talk about energy storage, think about these as batteries right. that are no longer hogs of energy, but storage elements of energies yes. that yeah. roam around the grid and deliver back energy. Right. Fukushima, yeah. which has been uh, you know, well known to all of us, Mitsubishi vehicles were driving in there and feeding micro power generation plants, and that was the only way they can get power into Fukushima after the disaster the was with too. EVs and, they and, the, and, and the leads. Yeah. So, so you could see that this is a uh, yes, it's a think about it. We put these charging infrastructure in place to reduce driver anxiety, and then we fix. Then we manage utility anxiety yeah. from all the charging infrastructure. <laughs> and also, I, I, I would want to say, don't um, utilities <coughs> cry a lot about EVs coming, but be careful about uh, framing how they're crying, because the way they make money is by putting in infrastructure. Yes. yes. And the way they put in infrastructure is by crying loud enough that the CPUC <laughs> will allow them to put it in. Right. So, and they charge they the consumer so, for yeah. it. They want to right, <laughs> because they, they don't make money on selling energy. Right. They're not allowed to. They pass through those costs. Right. Right. So it, it's important because I think a lot of consumers hear that somehow utilities think it's a problem, and it is absolutely not a problem. EVs are going to be the best thing that ever happened to yeah. utilities, and they're going to be the best thing that's ever happened to the grid. Mm -hmm. There's I just one thing think it's about interesting they're not marketing back to who's yeah. why is it somebody yeah. marketing EVs. Actually, as far as what you said at the very yeah. beginning, you know, the, the real key is information. And I think here you see really the combination of information and energy, and also transportation. Right. Yeah. So yeah, EVs are the are the largest fully networked load that someone's going to buy, mm -hmm. and they're the fastest growing unit of networked storage added to adding to the grid. So if you're talking about smart grid, you're talking about networked devices. Right. There's nothing else in your home that is networked. Your refrigerator's not networked. Your washer and dryer's not. I mean, nothing else is networked. Yeah. Sometimes your AC unit. Yeah. Go ahead. Two questions. Um, one question, um, will the dry or will the adoption rate of EVs have an impact on the utility business? Because anyone driving an electric vehicle might also think positively <coughs> about distributed power generation, putting in a solar system on the roof and refueling from their own roof. Um, so that would take away a lot from the utilities, from the existing utilities. So that's one question I have for the group. The other question, as Tesla is massively accelerating their charging, um, is there a scenario possible where, due to that acceleration, Tesla could become the de facto standard? 
It's a great question. So, so, so I, I, um, which one should I do first? Well, I'll just make a quick comment on that. So it's interesting you mentioned the solar arrays on the roof for EVs, and you guys probably know Solar City, which also went public, which mm -hmm. has an interesting relationship with Tesla. So there's no question that that entire ecosystem of renewable energy, which is really zero emissions and true green, infinitely green. Of course, some it'll you know don't have a field day. The press, oh, nothing's true green, and, and all this stuff, and we deal with this all the time. But there is an inextricable link between renewable energies. To, as a mitigation strategy because isn't it great to be able to drive around and not only get off fossil fuels but get off even things like coal and, and well certainly there things like coal parts. and natural natural gas. Um, so as far as would, would Tesla become the de facto standard, I'm going to say no. And, 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 and Forrest may, may differ in this and we go at it a little bit on this one. <laughs> okay, because Tesla is a dominating EV car company um, you guys have known the success, recent success in Wall Street. If you haven't driven one, go drive one. It, it's a, it's an experience you've never experienced before. It is the safest car on the road today. So it beat the business model of development actually became the safest car. They didn't design for the safest mm -hmm. car. It's the safest car. It has the lowest center of gravity. It's equal to a Lamborghini. Mm -hmm. Don't do this at home, but you can take a 30 mile an hour turn at 80 and not get the car to drift. There's a whole bunch wow. of interesting wow. things. Don't do this. Don't blame it on me, please. Okay. But here's why they won't become the standard. Because whether Tesla succeeds or completely fails, it won't have anything to do with the long-term attributes of EV. Because all the automotive manufacturers are heavily invested. And the J-plug standard will proliferate. So you'll see you're going to get Tesla as the standard. And it's a good quality product. It's a pretty cool design. It works pretty well so far, but uh, I, you know, I won't want to be a little careful there. So I'll, I'll go. Are you done? No, and then I'll just finish. <laughs> the, the, the products that we sell are J Plug compliant, Chatmo compliant, and we're seeing a tremendous ramp at a much faster rate than the Tesla ramp at probably about 100 times the deployment. So I don't think Tesla will be the facto standard on on quick charge. I got a follow up, Ellen. Um, sorry. Yeah. So we. we <laughs> I'm sorry. Part of, go ahead. You first. Uh, go ahead. Uh, okay. So if I was a restaurant owner, let's for, for example say, and I wanted to hire the customer, then I want a future oriented customer who's an early adopter because they're price insensitive. So I want them to come to my <laughs> restaurant because I've got a fancy restaurant. I'm going to put in a Tesla station. I'm going to put in a station with a Tesla plug on it because that's the customer I want. And anyone else who wants to show up and use it, that's great. They should have an adapter. And yeah. the reason I'm saying that is because exactly. the J-plug is, is about this big, charges to 16 amps, and Tesla is a third the size, <laughs> it's about this big, and it charges to, at 120 kilowatts, wow. potentially, or 100 kilowatts, somewhere between 90 and The J-plug can kilowatts. charge as high as 80 amps. We do right, 30, about they can do 40. Amps, so, but, so but, but <laughs> It's a massive thing. Now we're having fun. Oh, so, so <laughs> But here's the, here's the difference from my perspective, which is Tesla has everything to gain by marketing EVs, and, and all the other players are, have mixed motives. They're worried about cannibalization. Nissan makes a lot more money from other cars than they do from their Leafs. And so, so, so right now, Tesla is absolutely constrained in terms of how many cars they can produce, right? I don't know whether they can fix that problem. I don't know whether they can develop a car that's at a price point that most of us can afford. I do know they got full skin in that game, and no one else does. Okay, so I, I would. So that's and the they only just paid off their loan. Right, but I would suggest it's one great innovative company. It's I don't even call it a car company, right. by the way. And you're going to see Tesla do some amazing things that have nothing to do with vehicles, so mm -hmm. keep your eye out on that one mm -hmm. in the next five years, okay? Wow. So, so, yeah. but, 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 the, but what this ultimately means mm -hmm. is that there will not be one vehicle for North America or the yes. world. Oh no, never. And BMW's yeah. got big skin in the game. And Chevy's got huge skin in the game. But they've got skins in other games. That's my only issue. Right, and, they're, and they're, then they have a lot more skin in their other game. Ah, uh, but they're a lot more and, skin and in their other games, or are actually about, putting all their money in the future game. I, 
So look, yeah. I, I think it's, yeah. a, it's important okay. to recognize what Tesla's mm -hmm. done for this industry. And I, I always remember saying, They're thank God sex. for Tesla. Right. Because, <laughs> and here's why. Yeah. You know, you have, um, you have um, uh, national security was a big driver, you yep. know, f fossil fuel reduction. Yep. Carbon emissions, a big driver. Mm -hmm. Together alone, they don't cut it. No. No. They got cool factor right. and sex appeal with Tesla, right. and it goes real fast. Yeah. So, so I say thank God for Tesla because now you have a very stable base in which to for people to make choices. But if you pick every one of these folks here, I bet everyone has a different car, and maybe there's a couple of comp, maybe there's a couple of Prius overlaps yeah. that will proliferate. This is a trillion dollar business, to quote Shy. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. And Tesla is a leading driving innovator. Right. Okay. And, uh, and and thank God for Tesla and Elon. However, they will not determine the success or failure of the electric vehicle market because electrification transportation is a much bigger play than even one company can handle. I, I, but they I might absolutely. determine the standard for charging because their technology yeah. is better. Actually, there's a, there's a, there's a, no, that never, no, that never works. Spoken like that, that never works. You know, that's, no, but my argument is okay, a marketing okay. argument. There's right? a question in the far yeah. back. You're it. Well, I'm a new battery manufacturer. All right. Manufacturing saline batteries, mm -hmm. which are safe, non-toxic, yeah. and we're working on a two megawatt exactly. nighttime storage battery for utilities, mm. which cool. is half the size of lithium ion, the same size, half the price, same output. Mm. Yeah. I think It'll the run away. You know, the relationship to EVs is you will see collateral developments of technology and collateral businesses that come in along with this new supply chain, this new kind of ecosystem around the EV. Go ahead. When you when you go to a charging station, would there be something in the future where you'd exchange a battery so you get an instant battery instead of oh, instead oh, of yeah. having yeah, someone charge? Okay, so mm -hmm. that was that, that is that. A better place. The notion was, if you haven't heard this story, one of the big, one of the big elements of the technology solution was to sort of think of your of your tank as not part of the car, but but like you do a propane tank yeah. to your barbecue, right? And so instead of thinking about having to refill it all the time, just go change it. You don't yeah. give it who, which which petroleum canister you have. You just go exchange it for a full. Um, I, I whether that was a, 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 a you know a game winning idea or not we'll never know because as I said I think we blew it on the execution side mm -hmm. I, I really that's that's my feeling I don't think I don't think that the solution was either proven or disproven I was at Yokohama when we did the first uh, demo project there the technology worked magnificently. We had taxis coming in, going out. It took, you know, it was literally like driving through a car wash, but at three times the pace. And you get a new battery that was all filled up, and the taxi driver went out and went around Tokyo, came back, got the battery exchange. It worked beautifully. We screwed it up. And my feeling is we screwed it up badly enough that no one's going to try this for a while. Do you think part of that was timing? It's Market possible. I, you know, there were there are a whole long list of things that I, I would argue. You yeah, know, I think okay. part of it's structural. Okay. I mean, how many people's phones did they have an exchangeable battery here in this room? Yeah, that's true. Four that's years true. ago, probably a lot more people than today. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's true too. Uh, uh, yeah. Are they doing a similar uh, standard in China right now? They are, as I, as far as I know. When we, when back when, when we were, when we met with the Chinese. They, they wanted to see that. They, they actually came to several of the charging stations in Israel, whatever, uh, the battery switch stations, sorry. And um, they were all over this. And, um, and they proudly proclaimed that they had already done this. And we sort of said, oh, you know, I personally didn't know a squat about it. And I asked a lot of questions. And the answer was they had done it for the Olympics. They had electric buses. Mm -hmm. And they switched out the batteries. And you know, so we asked how they did it because the technology was pretty advanced. Let's just say that. Um, it wasn't a simple solution. It, it worked very well, but it was a complicated one. And um, we thought, hmm, what have, what have they got? And the answer was 
They said they had a hundred guys in the pit. <laughs> and so um, I don't know what they have today. And back in the Olympics, they had manpower, and I really mean manpower. Um, so you know, I don't know what they have today. Yeah, that's scalable. Yeah, and in China, it's scalable. <laughs> we got another comment from the back. Yeah, I just uh, I've read that uh, Tesla's probably headed in the direction of uh, going into the drivetrain business. The whole point is, uh, you know, you develop this sexy little car that gets a whole lot of attention, uh, and then, and then, you know, you could they could end up se selling drivetrains to the whole world, <laughs> to all the yeah, other car companies. Yeah. And if, well, mm -hmm. Forrest is the expert there. You know, battery drivetrain? technology, drivetrain technology. There's yeah. tremendous IP in Tesla. Yeah. Wait, yeah, Tesla could could go that way. They could. What is they already are. So they do yeah. the they do the drivetrain train for Rav Four and for uh, for Smart. Right. It's a locomotive then. Right. For some others that are coming oh, out. Yeah. Yeah. We're just no, no, way down the rack. We're just fleet but There's adoption. not that much margin. There. Hey guys, I just want to remind everybody that we are being videotaped and just. Uh, one question at a time, one yeah. conversation at a time, my, because I want people to be able to uh, allow Richard to moderate this, um, <laughs> allow him to do his job. I've got the easiest job <laughs> in the world. I mean, this and, is uh, easy. Uh, uh, <laughs> just, uh, uh, and 80% of the people Sorry. here are in the industry, um, and so uh, um, so I'd like, I want everybody to be able to get their questions answered, and the people who aren't here, I want them to be able to answer, answer the videotape. So, no, you weren't doing anything wrong. I'm not pointing to anybody. I'm just letting Richard... Okay, uh, Steve first. Where does fleet adoption fit in here? That's the largest single. It's an easy customer for you to go to. Sure. It's an easy customer for you to go to. They yeah. do take a while to, to adopt. A lot of them are going to natural gas or some variation thereof. Where does that fit in, you think, into the driving process for increasing increasing the volume yep. of electric vehicles? Sure, so, so I'm gonna let uh, 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 Forrest to comment as well because he's got a product. And, and yeah. so, so the, the, yeah. the quick comment there is, sure. it, it's one of the key segments, so mm -hmm. it's it's not overlooked, number one. Uh, the simplest approach is, uh, is the smaller fleet right away because the, the vehicles that are in the production level uh, that can do this type of small fleet uh, travel is a natural to, to quickly adopt EV. But a good example is FedEx just announced mm -hmm. the success they're having with their new uh, medium uh, duty fleets, which have a very um, predictable pattern. So specifically, if you think of what drives, the, what's the heartbeat of fleet, it's cost of operation. Mm -hmm. What's EVs do extremely well in? <coughs> cost of operation, there's a tremendous uh, um, marriage there. Uh, natural gas is better for long hauls and unpredictable routes. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll give you my two cents. So Better Place um, made a very big bet on fleets in Israel. And it was very much because, look, this is such an obviously economically smart thing to do. And fleets are managed by people who are held accountable for um, the financial for reducing costs of their operations. It, th there's truth to that. But remember this notion of who, what job are you hiring, who, and what are the risks involved. Fleet managers are not just held accountable for the cost of operations, they're held accountable for the reliability and availability. And they're not risk takers. Any, and you know, they're, they're not, uh, there are gonna be a couple. There are always a couple. And if you look back, you know, we were comparing this to the cell phone. Let's compare it to the PC industry. Were IT departments the early adopters of PCs? No. Absolutely no. not. We all went in and sort of banged our, you know, I, I was working at IBM at the time, yeah. one of the early PC companies. I brought my PC <laughs> into IBM. I had to like, yeah. right? It was like it was there. I, there was an old, you know, one of the first ones off the line sitting on John Watson's desk, John Watson Jr.'s mm -hmm. desk. Nobody was using it. The the IT department refused to buy them from their own company, <laughs> right? And so, you know, what? Wow. He, 
people who manage operations have to, you know, they have to, they're more worried about risk than they are about cost. I'm still using BlackBerry. By the way. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm the big company, but we're moving quickly to bring your own device. Which is far. Far. So, far. so I would, uh, I think that's a perfect um, e example. And the other thing I would add to that is that uh, the fleets are really demanding customers. So the early adopters are price insensitive. The right. fleets are not price insensitive. That's exactly and, right. And so if the battery dies, they are definitely going to get the warranty from the company. Whereas the early adopter, you know, might not even be driving that first Tesla they have sitting in the garage that only has 5,000 miles on it or whatever. Right? So I mean, it's, it's different. And then the other thing is that the industry is already going through one major transition right now, which is that a lot of them are moving to car sharing. So that they are able to reduce their fleets by a huge amount and do car sharing through software, and so they can probably only handle one major shift at a time. I mean, that's a pretty big shift already, yeah. um, but it's a, it's a huge one that's happening. Well said. Thank you. So, this is really great. I have really learned a lot, and my question as a practical woman is, how do you take everything that you said and put it together and develop a really nice value proposition for the beleaguered middle class. How can you sell us? So, so I'll start and I'll make it quick. Have you test driven an EV yet? I drive a Prius, which is not Great. the same thing. Great. So here's how you do it. Don't spend multi-millions of dollars on Super Bowl ads. Tesla certainly has it. Don't show up to the trade shows. Tesla certainly has it. Hop in a Chevy Volt. I'll take you for a ride tonight if you'd like. You can have the keys. Hop in a Nissan Leaf. Hop in a Tesla. Hop in a Ford C-Max Energy. Brilliantly designed car. Hop in a Ford Fusion. A $40,000 plug-in hybrid with amazing design and development and very cool electronics. And just drive it. And that whole thing comes to the practically um, driven. And the same decision that you made, the Prius, you'll actually like that in your next uh, decision to buy a car. You will never go back. And just try it and then uh, see, if, see if that was a crazy idea. Can I make a quick comment? Absolutely. So a few years ago, a uh, professor of electrical engineering at Stanford who had a Tesla Roadster, right, <laughs> said, you want to go for a drive? <laughs> of course. So we're driving up Sand Hill Road, and this thing is just, oh, it's Nice car, it's really interesting. There's one gear, right? Yes. And then he said, why don't you take it out on 280? And when you're on the accelerator lane, floor it. <laughs> I did. And the thing just, you know, it's like taking off in an airplane. <laughs> and, so, you know, and he looks it's at me as we get out onto, yeah. onto 280 and he says, ah, now you've got the Tesla smile. <laughs> <laughs> There's your there's your advertising. So, so, so by the way, I I'll, I will tell you. So the you, for you, the car is being hired for excitement. I I I don't get a smile over flooring my car. Frankly, How about ninety it's, miles per gallon average? Okay, yeah. no, that doesn't do it for me either. Um, but. What does it for me is that badge that says, we got to reduce our foreign dependence. We've yeah. got to reduce our mm -hmm. carbon footprint. I want to show I'm willing to put where my money, where my mouth is, and I'm willing to do that. And so for me, it's just a question of, for me, the appeal is I don't have to go to that goddamn gas station <laughs> ever again. So, yeah. you know, I'm dreaming of that solution and, and you know, I, I, well, I, I bought one because I didn't want to cry at the gas pump and because I wanted to make it home. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> See, they, sure. I mean, I so 48 miles yeah. an hour. Yeah, um, I, I think it's a really good question that you have, and I don't know if it's it's the middle class or if it's the next group after the early right. adopters. Right, you know, it's the early. Whoever yeah. it is, mm -hmm. um, I think that the whole industry has not come up with a really good answer to why. So they're coming up with a lot of what's, you know, well, it's mm -hmm. cost better, it's faster, it's exciting, yeah. it's what, well, there's all these things that are, that are attributes that are all positive now. But the answer to why is still a little bit muddled. It's like for some people it's green aspect, for some people it's cost aspect. I mean, I think there needs to be more of a unifying why. Cost Surely, I saw, I saw yeah. your hand first. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
Well, uh, interesting segue, and you were talking about marketing. Why isn't the rental car company being considered to market and introduce people to this experience? Yeah, so that way, um, Better Place tried that. Mm. It's the same problem again. Yes. A, a, re a rental company is in the business. They don't want any incremental risk. Mm -hmm. Any unknown is incremental risk. Mm -hmm. So. There are rental companies who, who will want to sort of be distinctive and specialize, et cetera, but Hertz wants to make sure you don't got no problems. Right. And you may not know how to read a, you know, they, they, you know you're in a city, you don't know where to charge. I, I, there, I don't, I think there's an option there for a rental car company to make, yeah. you know, a, a high-end rental car company mm -hmm. that's been, you know, marketing their I think whatever, it can be a very interesting innovative alliance if they align. Well, why don't you? Uh, I'm a rental car company. Yeah, go ahead. So I rent my car on. I have a Nissan Leaf. I rent it on Get Around. I made nine hundred and forty dollars last wow. year renting my car out, which is fifty percent higher than one hundred fifty percent of my energy cost for the so car. We just need more of that. And there it's are other. Track. There but are see, people all around the Bay Area right? that are renting that's, their cars. A, so but which I, one do you use? Get Get Around. I use get around, but there's relay rides and, and, and there uh, was a bunch wheels, of them. but they're right. gone. Um, so Enterprise has 12 locations. They've got 200 cars that they rent out. Hertz has locations that rent EVs. So definitely, it's, it's you, do, you don't know up. about it. You yeah. should rent them. But the rental car industry is, is also it's a real brutal t yeah. form of transportation. You're typically renting something to go you know somewhere far. So it's like the least right. useful mm. part right. of EV yeah. rentals. So. Yeah. I mean, two, two points. Let's, let's move ahead. Go ahead, you first, and then you. I was just going to say there is a, there is an exclusive EV rental uh, agency in San Diego that just rents the uh, smart EV. That's all. That's all they rent. Yeah. Yes. Uh, car. So is it Car to Go or what's it called? Mm -hmm. um, it's the Mercedes one. Yeah. Car to Go. It's Drive Now. So Drive Now is just electric BMWs. Yeah. Uh, it's in San Francisco and down here as well. And there's also we go. They can be an enabler, uh, potentially. Okay, your comment. And to the question of why not, or excuse me, to why, my answer is, well, why not? And people who drive EVs, early adopters, have a whole different relationship with carbon. People who drive an electric car for any distance, you have the test of smile on. You realize that you're not going to deal with oil changes, <coughs> with overheating, with crankshafts, with timing chains, with everything that goes wrong. You have a motor, and it's going to last. But it takes a, a different form of addiction. So people, mm -hmm. as you said, on an EV will never go back. Mm -hmm. People with gasoline are afraid to try because, uh-oh, I've discovered something new. Mm -hmm. And now I need an excuse to stay addicted. Mm -hmm. But I think the carbon thing, for some reason in this society, I mean, I personally you know, want to reduce my carbon footprint, but I feel like there's a lot uh, the non-early adopters aren't necessarily, when you say you reduce your carbon, to them they're hearing, I'm making a sacrifice to do something for the environment. Mm -hmm. And do I want to make that? It, it yeah. has this connotation of sacrifice, sure. which it re isn't a reality, mm -hmm. but it is tied up somehow in that question. I feel like. Yeah. I don't know, you know, the well, so the data sort of suggests, though, that that early adopters overlap fairly heavily with people who want to fix the world. So, you know, what happens is yeah. it's this yeah. liberal, you know, high education, fairly affluent, whatever. So that even though. If you talk to a late adopter, that is a reason not to buy. It actually works out that the that the psychographics of the mm -hmm. of those early adopters are pretty good for this story. Three quick ones. Yeah. You first. So so I'm an er early adopter, and I uh, I think one of the things that we have to do is shift from the idea of the of expense to investment. You know, one of the things that I did it at the same time was to get solar on my roof, and I got my car, and it hurt like hell for about four months mm -hmm. till I got my tax rebate and the credits that came back on the car. And now I'm saving, um, my car payment is $600 a month, which by itself would seem extreme compared to other options, but I save $200 a month on average for my electrical bill, mm -hmm. and I save $200 a month for gas. Yes. So it's really a $200 a month expense for me, and when it's paid off, it's going to be two hundred dollars a month net positive. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. and here's what no one one mm -hmm. talks about is you get fifty six and a half cents a mile if you're working that you can get reimbursed for mm -hmm. for mileage. So if you are a salesperson or someone who drives for work a lot, 
you you're making fifty dollars every time you drive a hundred miles. A week. <laughs> Try, because it costs you about a dollar forty. You will not see salespeople in the office anymore. <laughs> <laughs> you're next. Yeah. Yeah. So, so just really quick comment. I, I thought that the, the practical women's question was actually a really important one, and it and I don't think it really got addressed, which surprised me, because I've done the math and and. The CapEx will cost you about seven, eight thousand dollars more after your tax credits, and the OpEx is going to save you about fifteen hundred dollars a year for it, a typical car, the amount of distance it drives. So that amortizes itself in five years. Year six, you're in the in the black, right, with an electric vehicle purchase. I think that's the practical. That's the answer that the practical person needs to needs to hear. So and, and I didn't. And, and I, I'm lease, a little alarmed that I didn't hear any of you. You say can that. lease a Chevy Volt, depending on what month, like any car, 249 a month, no money down. The Fiat just came out. The Nissan Leaf has been up and down to 199 a month. The lease for 199 a month. I'm not saying that's a that's a special rate for the low end one. No, that's cheap, a, that's that's also low cheaper end. than your gas bill alone. So sell your 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 six year mo late model vehicle for nine thousand dollars. Pocket that. Put it in an annuity or the stock market. Lease <laughs> oh, yeah. lease the vehicle with very little down or a thousand dollars down. Save there depending on how uh, far you drive. If you go twelve thousand or fifteen thousand miles, depending on your commute, save anywhere between twenty four and thirty six hundred dollars mm -hmm. of American household expendable income. Put that money back into the economy and then watch uh, you know the economy raise and then self fulfill. I think that the framing of the simple ROI mm -hmm. calculation is probably holds pretty well in early adopter phase, EV ready phase, while the cell phone and mm -hmm. the, 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 you know, the issue you brought up. So sure, perhaps right now, we're, it's still for the early adopters who want to make that statement, but in a very short time, and I could even, we just proved mm -hmm. the math, mm -hmm. uh, we have to spend a little more time there, <coughs> is actually <coughs> beneficial today, and if not, in a couple years. Yeah, the and you the need to find a way of conveying that, because so, frankly, I sense a slight tinge of contempt toward people who are not early adapters. Adopters, so, sorry. So you need yeah. to kind of get no, beyond so, that and yeah. figure out how to... Look, I, I'm, I'm the one who brought this up, and let me be clear about this. It's... Um, there are things I'm early adopter on and things that I'm not, and I'm 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 a proud light, luddite on certain things. So I'm not, I, you know, I I'll, I'll declare that, and I, so you know, be, the reason I'm saying it is I've lived through multiple of these cycles. I mean, I I really my personal career was in the introduction of the PC, and we used to argue ROI till the cows. <laughs> I, I I can't tell you how many. How many ads I tested? How many focus groups I sat through? How many interventions? I, and ROI is a great rationale. Mm -hmm. It's not a marketing. Tool. It is not a marketing. Yeah, no. so <laughs> I, 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 I applaud you, and I will. I will. Thank you know, you, if I want thank something, you. okay. Thank if you. I want thank something, you. I will tell my husband that story, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> but I have to want it because I want it, not because it's a good investment. Exactly. I, 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 so I agree with the ROI, but what Mike actually answered with was you save money from day one yeah. and you continue to save yeah. more money forever. Yeah. So <laughs> I, that I think your answer, Mike, is the answer you, sh you should have given first to the practical woman's question because that's beautiful. But that's that's exactly what, what I'm thrilled about is yeah. less than an hour. Uh, there's, there's already this transformation that's starting to happen and it's an education yeah. process. So uh, I appreciate that. Thank you. Go ahead. All right, two things. Uh, first of all, I just heard that in the last day or so that last week or the week before, there was four million people on this planet protesting the Keystone Pipeline, and it didn't show up in the newspapers. Mm. Yeah. So that's the answer to why we are hearing it's being suppressed. Uh, the other question is for Mike, um, what are some rules of thumb? Do you have any rules of thumb for how much storage do you want for per kilowatt hour or per kilowatt capacity for smart grid, how much do you think we're going to need for EVs? You know, for for uh, solar and wind, for like for Schneider's solar installations. You know, what kind of storage market might we be looking at? Okay. 
it, it's a great question, and I'm going to have to defer to the storage experts, unfortunately. But what I can say is this, is um, Schneider Electric is involved in every aspect of the grid, including grid management, grid efficiency, demand response with utilities, and actually we're touching the consumer now with EV. So I don't have an, an it's, it's a tough, it's a tough uh, answer, frankly. So I don't have the empirical numbers of what's required to manage the grid effectively, but I can tell you that uh, we're doing a lot to do that at Schneider, and perhaps we, we take it offline. Yes. I want to invest in the company that has the predictive analytic to tell how much storage I need. Go ahead. Yeah, um, so uh, a couple of that, that answer is pretty broad, but um, California in particular is trying to go to 33% renewable energy, which was put in by Schwarzenegger and supported by Brown, and there's a lot of reports out there to get to 33%, we need to increase the amount of storage to about 5,000 megawatt hours, or increase the uh, number of frequency regulation uh, output by about 10x. Mm -hmm. So there is this increase that's kind of needed. How and another that 10x be? I mean, how much is there now, and how much would that be? There's about 800 megawatt uh, dash hours of frequency regulation up and down, and so it's about you know. I don't yeah, okay. I think Six to eight that times that. Uh, we're going to have to move toward so. a conclusion here. Yeah. And I think the tone of this has been altogether too positive. <laughs> so, for my last question to the panel, what's going to mess this up? What are the biggest dangers? What are the things that really we need to watch out for and try to avoid in terms of this road to the EV? Forrest, you go first. I don't, I don't think there's any way we can reverse. Um, uh, you know, we're in a delicate period. You don't think they can screw it up? I, I don't think so because I know Tesla really well inside and out and they won't screw it up. They're, they're really the shining star and they're the leader and they'll stay that way. Um, so I don't feel, you know, we were at 1% of California sales this quarter were EVs or plug-in vehicles. Yeah. So that's, that's pretty big. And I think, you know, when we get to 5%, then that's probably the tipping point where they're really in the clear. But I don't think they're going back. Ellen? Mm. So I think there's a lot of things we can do to screw it up, whether it will ultimately change the, the, the ultimate future. Probably not. But there are things we can do that, that substantially delay it. Um, we've talked about some of those things already. Um, you know, I do think that, um, it, you know, I'll, I'll go back to Clayton Christensen and disruptive innovations. The, you know, entrenched companies have an interest in, in their entrenched product lines and what they're good at. Mm -hmm. And they can say they're spending, you know, a billion, mm -hmm. trillion dollars on whatever it is, but they know where their revenues are coming from. Mm -hmm. And so they can slow down this process. <laughs> Especially they know where their profits are coming That's from. That's exactly. right, exactly. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, I do worry that there are a lot of players with a lot of um, other skin in a lot of other games that can slow it down. Okay. Yeah, it's fair, it's good assessment. I'd say um, one of the major things that can screw it up is the lack of adequate infrastructure. So I, I don't think it will necessarily screw it up, it just will change the time dimension. Yeah. And of course we do want to, uh, we believe our analytics show, our, our, our data suggests that this is a nine inning ball game and you think of it from 2012 to the end of the decade and so uh, what could make this a 20 inning ball game mm -hmm. right lack of adequate infrastructure mm -hmm. uh, grappling politically between uh, the, um, the sectors and making this a political uh, quagmire mm -hmm. um, that's certainly you know it already that, happened. I, yeah, mm -hmm. and, and I already believe that that's the key. I think what we'll find is a lack of interoperability. So if, if too many people get real greedy about this, it'll stop things in its tracks versus an integration of interoperability. Those are the things that could delay, but it, it is not going to stop. We've got various comments that people want to make. Um, Ellen, can we do two more comments from the audience before you do? Okay. You we know, first. We know folks you're... have a limited amount of time, and yeah. you know, we, yeah. we appreciate your support. <coughs> I, I believe the one thing that could really screw it up would be three media hyped up fatalities yeah. on the road. Yeah. Three families in different regions of the US yeah. that die in three car accidents with EVs. Won't screw it up. It'll delay it. Yeah. 250 car, fi thousand car fires a year. Um, I, you know, I, I, this, I, this is a heartfelt issue for me. Uh, personal friend, uh, Los Gatos, friend of a friend, uh, 
wife blows up in a in a in a gas powered vehicle, mm -hmm. falls off the edge of the street and dies. Didn't even make the news. Wow. Yeah. Okay, the Chevy Volt that they took to the rotisserie tests at NHTSA where they legitimately rolled the thing and forgot to drain the battery had a smolder two weeks later and it was front page everywhere. So this is the classic, and, and I may close in this, the innovator's dilemma, Clayton Christensen, classically disruptive innovations take way longer than people think. The Kindle took 20 years, okay, it takes infrastructure, internet, uh, legal uh, relationships with pub publishers, devices, multiple devices. Mm -hmm. It's not like an overnight sensation. So it'll take a while. Nothing will screw that up, including the dreaded uh, family issue. Last comment. If the price of oil plummeted, I can't imagine that. But if it did, that would really derail. Uh, that Big time. Yeah. I, I think, again, well, it, it, somebody, yeah, I, I don't understand. Can somebody explain why it won't? Because we're too invested in, in unconventional crude that needs 60 70 80 dollars a barrel to suck to out survive. of the earth. Yeah, yeah. The, the cost so, of actually sucking out of the earth has been going up, up continually, so that even if yeah. there might be a slight oversupply every once in a while, but with China coming up, I mean, it just seems really unlikely that that's. Well, that's but it could. Okay. Sort of good news. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that note, sort of good news. Hey, there you go. Let's uh, call it into the phone part of the show. <laughs>